Good afternoon. My name is David O, and I chair a Council's Committee on Global Opportunities and the Creative Innovative Economy. Uh, I'm now calling to order the hearing on Resolution 140220, and I'll ask the clerk to read the title of the bill. I'm sorry, of the resolution. Resolution 140220, authorizing City Council's Committee on Global Opportunities and a Creative Innovative Economy to hold public hearings on the state of the growing technology and innovation community in Philadelphia and the impact on the local economy. Thank you very much. Um, this hearing is uh, uh, being organized as part of Philly Tech Week, and um, that in of itself tells you that it is really the, uh, the community itself that organically has grown in Philadelphia and is uh, promoting um, within their own community uh, innovation and uh, creativity. And uh, in our role as uh, government, we very much are interested in being supportive and finding out how we can best support this growth. Um, the, uh, the creative innovative uh, community in Philadelphia has been transformational of our city and uh, I certainly uh, know that my colleagues here on City Council, the mayor, uh, very much appreciates your work. Not only um, are you um, bringing new vigor and energy and perspectives to our city, but many of you are also uh, involved in our communities and neighborhoods, giving a fresh new appreciation uh, to what has once been seen as tired old neighborhoods. And uh, part of that, I think, is the opportunity for the revitalization and the new significance of Philadelphia as we are uh, hopefully an emerging economic force here on the East Coast. We have a lot of challenges, but the tech sector is not for us one of them. However, we have our work cut out for us, and we're very interested in hearing from our witnesses today who are leaders in the tech field. Um, this uh, Philly Tech Week is organized uh, by uh, technical, Technically Philly. Chris, help me out. Technically Philly? Okay. I run across so many names, I sometimes forget. But I have good staff to remind me. And so, uh, technically, um, technically Philly, is that right, Chris? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm looking at my notes, it's not what it says. But technically Philly, Chris Wink is here, and so I'd ask him to take the stand and give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, members of council. Um, I think my role as uh, the editor of a technology news site in, in Philly, uh, we also are in Baltimore and Brooklyn, I just wanted to very quickly set up the conversation of our, our, five, uh, our five leaders, uh, maybe by sharing a, a few data points and trends that we've seen reporting in the technology business community over the last five years. Uh, I, I do want to make that clarification that the technology community is, is widespread. This is, this is probably, this is business focused in the technology business community. Um, but a few things that we've seen reporting. First, I think is a very important mindset to know. Uh, in the 1990s era technology, we watched companies pursue investment capital. And investment capital is largely suburban based. Um, in this era, we're watching companies pursue talent and then therefore investment pursue companies. And in the rise of urbanism that's happening nationally, that's why we're watching technology communities flourish in cities. So the opportunity for the city of Philadelphia to see itself as a leader regionally as it should be is is rare and important so that's the first dramatic trend we and you'll hear from from people today discuss the idea that driving talent acquisition is an enormous reason why being city-based trumps a lot of the other issues that we're going to hear about um, uh, a couple other trends that we, we've certainly seen the conversation of uh, business taxes is every, is something that's familiar to all of you so i don't need to trump through that again but i've been amazed by how often uh, education in schools come into the conversation around entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm very excited for you to hear from Chris Sarah later today uh, from ArcWeb who will talk about that. But the idea that entrepreneurs are making decisions about where they want to live and work, that's making the education conversation that touches every other sector that you guys need to address come into the technology class as well. 
Um, and a, a few data points on, on Monday during Philly Tech Week, uh, Monday afternoon with the Center City District, we're going to release the results of a survey of 70 uh, tech CEO entrepreneurs in Philadelphia, and we'll get all that data to you. Uh, there's a trove of information there, but a few data points that I think might be most relevant and interesting to you guys. Um, one overall, how, does, how do Philadelphia technology entrepreneurs view Philadelphia on a scale of 1 to 10? 6.8. So above average, room to grow. 75% um, uh, of those companies surveyed are hiring software developers in the next six months. Um, and that's more in the city than in the suburbs. So software, those firms that are hiring software talent are looking at the city to be based. Software talent is increasingly younger, they're increasingly city-based. Um, another big thread that I thought was really important, uh, what has been the biggest success of Philadelphia's technology community over the last five to seven years? The biggest uh, uh, vote of sur those surveyed was the idea of a network of technology companies. Um, that's this idea that once you start a clustering of any companies in any sector, they want to remain around each other. So the long-term value of, of clustering companies in crimson is incredibly important. Will Reynolds from um, Sierra Interactive will discuss the idea of Nerd Street, which Council has endorsed. That's colorful and cheeky, but it also helps develop this identity that clusters businesses and it makes companies sticky and stay. Uh, we increasingly report on the idea once you cross 12 to 15 employees, you're much more likely to stay in the general vicinity. Um, that's a big opportunity to get companies there. And the last uh, point that I'll share and, and, and see my time, um, more than half of those surveyed in our survey, again, I'll, I'll share that data more specifically, but more than half said that bootstrapping, the idea of building a business on, on one's own capital before seeking investment, um, that bootstrapping was the strength of, of, of the city of Philadelphia. That was its, its differentiator from other markets. That ties into the idea of it being low cost, it ties into being on the East Coast um, and accessible to other investment, uh, other uh, clients, but, but affordable. So, that should lay the framework of, of, of how we see uh, the trends of satellite offices, of outside suburban or other firms opening um, offices in the city. Um, we've seen that and reporting, that, reporting on that regularly. You'll hear from another example. Um, David Adadan from Tra Trellis uh, Marketing Technologies will discuss that. Um, but that I think we can fairly say that a technology community probably does credit the Nutter administration with really great work. Commerce does, I think, is well liked. Um, in, the, in the broad technology community, I think that is seen as a success. Uh, how that flips over to long-term stickiness is probably that next trend. That's where the taxes and the education conversation will come back. But I think largely you're, you're going to see a technology community that views Philadelphia positively, particularly the city. I think there's very high energy. Um, we now need, need to go to the next step. We've had tremendous success over the last five years. It's now how do we make everyone stick, stay, and grow. Uh, and with that, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity here. You have five true leaders of the Philadelphia technology community today that will give incredible insight into how this community. We're about 500 companies in the city of Philadelphia, 5,100 in, in, in the region, uh, according to census data. So this is not an insignificant part, um, um, probably in the 15 to 20,000 jobs range. So those numbers are really challenged quite a bit. Um, but with that time, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, let me just let everybody know that uh, while we are speaking, you are actually being uh, broadcast and uh, you are being uh, recorded. We have uh, your testimony being transcribed. Uh, oftentimes, we use the testimony at future points in time as well for some of the other efforts that we undertake. Um, I'd like to recognize our committee co-chair, uh, Councilman Marion Pasco. And uh, uh, this morning, uh, we kicked off here in City Council Tech Week with a resolution uh, recognizing uh, Tech Week sponsored by my colleague, Councilman Maria Quinones Sanchez, who is sitting here to my right. And so let me uh, ask uh, Councilman Quinones Sanchez if she'd like to make an opening remark. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you for um, providing this important hearing uh, to, as you said, document um, and share some of the good things that are going on. Um, I was happy to sponsor uh, the resolution on Tech Week. I would uh, be remiss not to mention my former colleague, Councilman Bill Green, who I think uh, once he got elected um, was very steadfast in bringing to our attention in Council um, the, the benefits of technology, not only because of the, its contributions to the economy, but, uh, but to government. And, you know, we pride ourselves in the Commerce Department um, sells Philadelphia as 
uh, a premier location because we are a day's drive from almost two-thirds of the country. Um, but through technology and what we've learned um, through this constituency is that we are actually at the doorsteps of the world. Um, and the work that all of you do um, help put uh, Philadelphia on the map, not only uh, in this country, but uh, around the world. Um, you have demonstrated and shown us the importance and the value of technology as it relates to government, our efficiencies. Um, uh, Councilman Green constantly talked about a, a paperless government, and I think we've made great strides in part because of the conversations um, and the discussions that we've learned um, from this sector. The, the accountability in government, you know, everybody can now Google everything, and I think that makes us a better society when we can see um, what is going on at all times. The transparency of, of government uh, becomes incredibly important, and obviously the economic utility and vitality of what the sector brings. I, I think that, and I appreciate um, the work that's going to be done over the next week, and you know, when we did what was the blogger's tax or a non-tax, uh, some of those pieces of legislation that Councilman Green and I worked on, we did it because we had a conversation with you and you told us these are the things that we need. Um, but we are at that brink, at that tipping point that we now have to say um, we want the, this community to grow, but we also want you to stay. And so how do, how do folks stay in the city? Um, the, the conversations around taxing is important, education, because uh, ultimately it is about if you're uh, an employer or a CEO of 12 to 15 um, workers, will you stay? And, and what is an incentive that you provide to your employees um, so that, again, we can compete in this global market. So I thank you. I um, am a tech-challenged person. Uh, I must admit my son, my 15-year-old, is the one that attempts to teach me this stuff. But what I do know is that we have a responsibility both in our school district um, and as a government to ensure that we are maximizing the creativity that all of you bring to this table. And so that's why I appreciate Councilman O taking the leadership on this and, and formalizing the discussion that you have around Tech Week in this council chamber. So I really thank you um, for your work and um, for being uh, as proactive as you have been when sometimes we are not. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Um, at this time, then, uh, would you like to make a statement? Uh? Yes, okay, so brevity. Uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the first witness. Luke Butler from the city's Department of Commerce. Good afternoon, Chairman of Councilwoman Canerna Sanchez and Councilwoman Tasco. Um, my name is Luke Butler. I'm the Chief of Staff to Alan Greenberger, the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, who apologizes that he couldn't be here himself, but he had a schedule conflict. Um, first, I want to thank uh, uh, Chairman O and, and the members of the committee for holding this hearing. I think the hearing itself is um, another demonstration of the, the willingness of city government to engage with the technology community um, and to work with uh, the leaders within this community to find out how can we, what more can we do uh, to help them. Um, the administration across the board is committed to establishing Philadelphia as one of the great uh, cities for entrepreneurship and innovation in America. And the reason that we're able to pursue such an ambitious goal is because of the strength within the entrepreneur entrepreneurial community itself. And as Councilman O has mentioned, um, they were the driving force behind this hearing and, and the driving force behind uh, much of what we do. Um, the excitement and dynamism generated by many of the organizations represented here today is one of many reasons why Philadelphia is becoming such an attractive place for innovative companies and the talented workforce that they need in order to grow. Over the last couple of years, we've worked in a number of ways in collaboration with the community itself to support startups and entrepreneurs in Philadelphia. Um, and I can give you just a few examples. We are working to increase the availability of early stage capital in Philadelphia and to build on much of the work already being done by organizations such as Ben Franklin Technology Partners and Robin Hood Ventures, among others. We worked very hard to attract first round capital to Philadelphia and are currently working to bring a number of new venture funds into the city. 
With our partners at PIDC, we launched Startup PHL, which is a broad initiative to support entrepreneurs and startups in Philadelphia. And one of the elements of that is a $6 million uh, public-private seed stage uh, venture fund, uh, which is comprised of $3 million from PIDC and $3 million from First Round Capital and managed by First Round Capital uh, to make investments in Philadelphia-based startups. Uh, we have announced the first uh, investment in a company called Real Food Works, which moved to the city uh, because of this investment, and we hope to announce uh, more in the coming weeks and months. And uh, PIDC has also invested in the Science Center's QED program uh, and in Dream Adventures, which is an accelerator program which recently announced uh, that it would locate its world headquarters in Philadelphia. Uh, another element of Startup PHL is the Call for Ideas, which is a $500,000 grant program uh, from the Commerce Department to provide small amounts of funding to organizations that are providing programming and training uh, and events that boost entrepreneurship and startups in Philadelphia. Through this initiative, we select, solicit the best ideas from across the city and then enlist the guidance of leaders from the startup community to help us decide which ideas could be the most impactful. We've approved 10 grants so far and have received more than 170 submissions over two funding rounds. Um, and one important point about the Call for Ideas is it's not purely technology uh, entrepreneurs, it's entrepreneurship across the board. So for example, one of the recipients of that funding was the Enterprise Center uh, in West Philadelphia for a, a culinary entrepreneurship program. Um, additionally, we're also working to raise the profile of Philadelphia's technology scene and over recent months, we've held a number of events with fast-growing technology companies such as Artisan Mobile, Curel8, and RJ Metrics, uh, all companies that are raising money, expanding their presence in the city, uh, hiring uh, new people, uh, and creating jobs. And the goal is to highlight these success stories uh, to demonstrate that Philadelphia is fast becoming a hub for these types of companies. And by raising the profile of the companies, it helps to attract more. Um, you'll hear from um, a company this afternoon that is establishing a presence in the city, um, and a number of others such as Fiberlink and Bentley Systems and Sev1 have done the same by establishing gateway offices uh, in order to attract uh, uh, talent and the workforce that wants to be here. Um, while others like Brand.com have moved their whole companies into the city. Um, and a big reason for that is, is the, the tax work that's been done by this uh, council, the targeted tax reductions uh, that help smaller new companies, uh, that help investment funds uh, move into the city. Uh, that's a very useful tool uh, in attracting these types of companies. Um, the success of our city is tied to the growth and success of the technology community and the broader uh, innovation economy. Uh, these are fast-growing companies that create jobs and help create an environment that young, educated people uh, and, in fact, workers of all age uh, want to be part of. Um, but it is one of the reasons why Philadelphia has experienced the largest growth in 20 to 34-year-olds of any major city over the last eight years. Uh, people want to live and work in this city, and the companies that want to hire them uh, are moving in uh, to follow them. And so this administration, and uh, I believe this council, is committed to doing all that we can to support the continued growth of our technology company, uh, community uh, and to establishing Philadelphia as one of America's great startup cities. And we look forward to a continued partnership with council and with the community uh, to find out what else we can be doing uh, to help support them. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Let, let me recognize that uh, Councilman uh, Bobby Heenan is uh, in the room, waving hello. He's a techie guy. He's a techie guy, and uh, certainly a, a leader for this council, particularly in uh, um, manufacturing and, uh, and other types of uh, economic development. Um, so uh, let me then uh, open this up for questions, uh, starting with uh, the uh, uh, Maria Quinones Sanchez. Thank you. Um, wanted to um, find out if the Commerce Department is doing any tracking as it relates to how many new company, companies in the city for new licenses are tech-based, number of employees, and I economic impact. Are we doing any of that specifically? Yeah, we do. Yes, yeah, we have a, uh, within the Commerce Department, we have a, a kind of a policy and research function that looks at, uh, through the Bureau of Labor Statistics, looks at the uh, the NAICS codes, the types of companies that are moving in and, and to see where there is growth. Uh, and we have seen growth in the, in the technology uh, community and we're certainly happy to provide 
uh, that analysis to Council. I think it would be important if you can submit it to the Chair for the purposes of this record. Um, and, and maybe one of our goals for next year for Tech Week would be to produce some data around that so yeah. that they can incorporate it as part of what we're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman uh, Tasco. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, for coming to testify. I want to thank afternoon. all the uh, um, uh, our citizens who've come out to participate in this dialogue. Um, I was in um, um, Cleveland a few years back, and uh, they took us on a tour of the city in terms of how they're revitalizing or, uh, the, and the city and also um, changing some of the land use issues there. And what I found to be quite exciting was that they had taken an area where there were um, maybe garages or a foundry or a factory and turned it into a work-live situation. Mm -hmm. So for small companies who are just starting, uh, maybe uh, we could look at some of the areas in the city where we might consider that given our zoning uh, laws, sometimes you're not allowed to have a business where you live yeah. unless you go through a lot of the, of the details of zoning. But uh, I thought it was quite creative, and it was a very attractive area of the city. And I've always thought about how we might make that work for Philadelphia. I think it's definitely something that we can take a look at. And I think we're seeing in certain, um, certain neighborhoods um, the reuse of old industrial space mm -hmm. uh, is often some of the most attractive space uh, for these, these companies. I was, in a, I was visiting a company a couple of weeks ago that took an old textile factory and is now using it. Uh, as a design uh, company, and so those types of reuses of, of buildings are very attractive to these types of companies, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard from the administration um, about your general uh, uh, perspective on uh, technology here in Philadelphia, and I don't know if this is an unfair question because you're here for um, uh, Alan Greenberger, our, our deputy mayor. But let me ask you, if you're aware, what would you see or what does the department see as the most challenging issues in, in, from the administration point of view for the city of Philadelphia? What do we have to get on top of in order for us to uh, be as competitive uh, as possible? Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, a lot of the issues that, that you will know about, I mean, we continue to reduce uh, the tax burden, uh, which is helpful, but um, a big city like Philadelphia, that's always, we're always going to be uh, a little bit more expensive than, um, than perhaps other places, uh, but I think we're making progress uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. One of the big issues, I think, is just getting the word out. I mean, I think that it's starting to happen, um, and companies, and companies are moving in because of that. But one of the challenges that we have, I think, is that Philadelphia isn't uh, well known uh, yet, or is becoming more well known as a as a technology hub. Um, and so I think as the as more and more people find out about this, and as the word spreads, as it is, I believe at the moment, uh, I think that will attract more and more companies and, and people into the city. Uh, I have a cousin who. Um, is leaving Drexel University, I'm sorry to say, but he uh, was a professor of robotics. Um, and uh, he is going out to uh, Nevada because he, in, at this point in time, is, is focused on drone technology. And he is saying that, uh, um, and I'm quoting him and I'm you know, not blaming anything on him, but that he would say that the West Coast gets it far more than the East Coast and that the governments out in the West Coast are on top of applications around being able to do things um, uh, with the federal government and that we are slow. Um, what's your evaluation of that type of statement? I think that the West Coast uh, has been uh, more active for longer in that regard, but I think that uh, we're catching up. Um, and program. I, mean, I talked about the, the public-private venture fund that we have. That was modeled on something that New York City did in order to increase uh, the amount of venture capital in New York. So I think that East Coast cities are uh, trying to find new innovative ways uh, that they can support these types of companies. From a government structure point of view, are we lacking uh, something or is our, um, uh, the configuration of our city government 
Um, uh, is it lacking in something uh, when it comes to the most competitive cities? Uh, what do you see there? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that the, maybe the, uh, the, the folks from the technology community itself may have a perspective. I don't know that we're lacking. I think that we're, uh, we're looking at what is happening in other cities and trying to replicate uh, the best practices here. Um, I talked about the example from New York, uh, something that we brought here. Um, we, um, I think, continue to work to streamline uh, government and to make it easier to do business in the city. Uh, I think the tax reductions that the council has passed are a big part of making it easier to do business here. Um, so we're always looking to, to hear more and, and we talk quite regularly uh, with all types of business people, but in this context specifically with leaders of the technology community to ask what are the types of changes that we can make uh, that will make it for e easier for you to create jobs in the city. Well, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, then I will thank you for your testimony. Thank you, um, at this time, we are now going to hear from our uh, uh, witnesses, our experts from the tech community. And uh, with that kind of an introduction, I hope that we'll encourage you to uh, let us know what it is that uh, we need to do or let us know what is good about Philadelphia so that we understand uh, what you are challenged with and, and what it is about our city that perhaps is something that we have to continue because it is very uh, encouraging and good for you. So with that, uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the panel of witnesses. Ellen Weber of Robin Hood Ventures. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and provide us with your testimony. Okay. Hello, my name is Ellen Weber, and I'm the executive director of Robin Hood Ventures, uh, one of the leading angel groups in the region. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak to you about the tech community and its importance to Philadelphia. I've had the fortune to be part of this tech community before some of the people back there were even born. Um, and, in and in fact, when I started my career, I had to move out to Great Valley because there was no entrepreneurial community in the city. I moved out there kicking and screaming and I'm delighted to be back and, and being part of the, uh, the Philadelphia ecosystem. Um, in 1999, at the beginning of the tech uh, bubble, I decided to leave corporate tech and to help grow startup companies. I did that through consulting and we also did that, uh, several colleagues and I decided that the time was ripe to fundamentally change how early stage investing was done in Philadelphia. And so we launched Robin Hood Ventures, um, which is a professionally managed angel group, the first of its kind in the region, and now the leading angel group in Philadelphia. I'm here today to talk to you about um, angel investing, how we fit into the community, and how the city can help us uh, create even more investment. Um, Robin Hood is comprised of 35 successful entrepreneurs who invest not only money, but their time, their contacts, their experience, and their knowledge to early stage companies. If today is any example, this morning two of the members of the group were advising startup companies on strategy. Two of us were at, a, um, at an event at Penn, um, helping uh, uh, judging a contest. And this afternoon, there will be three people from Robin Hood who are talking to, I believe, um, I believe 90 people are coming to learn about how to get access to angel money. So we're very active and involved in the community. Um, and it's important to understand um, angel investors are successful entrepreneurs who want to invest, but they're not just doing it for the money. This is a way of them giving back to the city to the, um, and to the entrepreneurial community uh, from which they came. Um, we have invested in 50 companies. Um, we've invested in life science, in healthcare IT, in uh, B2B software, in e-commerce. Our investments in the Philadelphia, in, in the city of Philadelphia itself, include Charge It Spot, 12C, CloudMine, LuxTech. In addition, we've invested in 45 other companies in the Phil Philadelphia region. We're very regionally focused. Um, the entrepreneurial community requires a balance of entrepreneurs, investors, universities, corporations, it needs place and density, as uh, Chris was talking about before, and it needs civic support. In talking to my peers from other cities, Philadelphia has some major advantages. Organizations like the Science Center, which provide place and services, 
organizations like BioAdvance and Ben Franklin, which provide early funding and guidance. Our universities provide us with a wealth of technology. And as you said before, we're in very close proximity to so many major markets. This is a livable, vibrant, affordable city with a strong arts community for technologists. Now on the plus and minus side, we have a tight community, a very tight knit community, but you have to figure out how to get inside it, and that's one of the issues, and I believe that the city can help us with that. Um, it's, um, we also have a wealth of students who provide us with the opportunity for technology workers, but we have to figure out how to engage them in the startup community, and you can help us with that also. We hear over and over again, well, let me start with, um, just to give you a sense, $420 million of venture capital was invested in the Philadelphia region in 2013. Um, that's out of $29 billion that was invested nationally. Now those aren't local investors. That's the amount of, of venture capital money that came in to the, uh, to the Philadelphia region. I don't know how much was specifically Philadelphia. I know the two biggest investments were outside, but it's, it's, it's still the region. Biotech and software uh, take the lion's share of that venture capital investment. Um, so, as part of Robin Hood, I hear over and over again, especially because I live in the city, can't go to a gym, I can't go to a bar, I can't go anywhere without seeing an entrepreneur who pulls me over and says, we need more investors in this community, more early stage investors in this community. We do have about five angel groups at last count, um, and the number does go up over time, but these groups are small. And um, I go to national angel events, and I am surprised how small that number is compared to other regions. So we really do need to increase the number. We need to make it easy for people who are thinking about investing to learn how to do it. And we need to go out to people who aren't necessarily tech entrepreneurs, people who wouldn't necessarily become angels, and, have them, and get them to think about that. And the city can help with that. These are philanthropists who might not normally think about angel investing. Um, I know in D.C., for example, they were able to um, bring in lobbyists and they were able to bring in the military um, industrial community, not necessarily people who would generally be investors. We need to do that. We need your help to do that. Um, Robin Hood actually has kicked off an initiative recently to create more investors and particularly women investors. There is a definite uh, deficit of women investors in the community and you need women investors to invest in women-led companies and that would be another hour here. Um, we also need more exits, um, and then we need more celebration of exits. When you have exits, that creates more people with money who want to invest back in. It creates more of a feeling of success. Um, Robin Hood moved um, in 2009 from the suburbs to the Science Center. It was a really big step for us. I had to convince um, a lot of our members that, yes, I would be able to find you parking. Um, and. Um, you know, and, and that uh, there would not be any undue um, legal requirements for, for our, I mean, it was really uh, something we had to work on. But since we've moved, we've found tremendous amount of um, benefits from being here. First of all, the um, entrepreneurs who, in all cases, who don't necessarily have driver's license can find their way to us. We're part of the density that Chris talked about earlier, which is so important. Um, you know, we can easily talk to a number of investors in a short period of time, a, a number of uh, uh, entrepreneurs in a, in a period of time. Entrepreneurs know where to find us. Um, and it really has helped us engage and connect with the community. Um, in terms of what, you can, what the city can do to help us, the most important thing we believe you can do is reduce friction. And by that I mean make things simple. Simplify business taxes for the co companies that we invest in. They don't have accountants. They don't have people who can figure out the whole structure. So, so anything you can do to help being compliant with taxes um, would be a benefit. Publicize the advocates that you have to help the startup communities navigate the city requirements. I know they exist. I don't know where to find them. And I don't know if, our, if um, most of the entrepreneurs know where to find them. Um, contract with startups for business. Um, be their first customer. That's a tremendous benefit. But you have to make it easy. They can't go through the whole formal procurement process that requires, you know, whatever it requires. There's got to be a shortcut to doing that, and other cities have figured out how to do that. Um, and that includes some of the, um, the city-related organizations like SEPTA, PICO, PPA. Um, another example of reducing friction, make it easier for startups. One of the things we hear 
um, is when it's time to move into real office space out of the incubators, they have to put in a large deposit. They can't afford to do that, but they're good for the money. So if there's a way to have the city provide a guarantee to the landlord or a loan for the security deposit, that would go a long way. Um, the other thing you can do is really acknowledge and help celebrate the success of our startups and I would selfishly say the success of our angels. When a company um, gets local investing, that should be part of the story because that, every time a story goes out about um, Robin Hood or another local group who's invested in a company, I immediately get calls from five or ten people, hey, I might think about investing. So if you can help us publicize that. Um, and talking to my colleagues in other cities, we found that one of the best ways that they've had to build a startup culture is to publicize success and to really change the risk culture that we have. That's part, it is part of the culture of this city. Entrepreneurs stay where they get funded and where they get supported. And so for them to know that deals actually happen is tremendously important. And um, that concludes my remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, that very valuable information. And uh, let me ask uh, my colleagues if they have questions or the, if they're still formulating the questions. Okay. Questions? Yes. So um, let me ask you, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman Tasco. Um, I was a little distracted for a moment, so I, I hope you will forgive me if I ask you a question and you've already spoken on it. Um, the angels. Mm -hmm. Are you? I'm an angel. You're an angel. Mm -hmm. And um, what is the normal? People call me other things, but yes, I'm an angel. <laughs> what is the normal uh, contribution for investment? What's the average, I guess? Um, over the lifetime of a company, we mm -hmm. will invest anywhere between one million to two million. Mm -hmm. We might start with 50,000. We might start with, generally we start around 200,000. Um, but sometimes someone from our group will just invest a little bit of money in the company to get it to what we call proof of concept. And then once it gets proof of concept, it can go, that company can go back out and get more funding. At that point, we might put in 250, and then when it gets to the, to the next step, we might, you know, we might put in more money, up to one to two million dollars. And we generally co-invest with other local angel investor groups in the region. We, co-invest with Ben Franklin. We find them to be an extremely important partner. And we uh, co-invest with other early stage venture capitalists. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, when you talk about um, maximizing um, the, uh, the ability for your company to um, attract other investors and to uh, distribute your funds and to then publicize su success stories. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at how the city can be helpful, mm -hmm. um, could you give me some some ideas that you might have? And, and I'll start the ball rolling by okay. simply asking. I mean, you've kind of indicated we have a very small number of angel investor organizations or groups here in Philadelphia. Is there um, any benefits to having regular uh, angel investment, you know, uh, uh, days where various startup companies can come in front of the group of you mm -hmm. and you can simultaneously reach out to other yes. angel investors? Does that happen? That happens. That, okay. that absolutely happens and uh, with more and more regularity. And actually, um, Ben Franklin recently uh, ran an event where they had companies we'd already invested in get in front of all the other angel groups so that we could kind of, um, you know, they would have some credibility because some of the groups had already invested, um, so it made it easier to do co-investment. So that occurs. There's a tremendous number of individual angel investors, so they're a little bit different than the groups. I represent a group of, of investors. It's the individual angel investors or people who are thinking about doing it, uh, who are just even thinking about investing that we don't have access to. And I think if there's a way, and I don't know what that is, I'm going to have to do some more deep thinking after I, I leave here, but, um, you know, if there's a way for you to help funnel some of those people to the groups 
to Ben Franklin, who knows how, where to funnel them to. Um, I think, and I think you all probably talk more to philanthropic organizations than we do. Getting them to think about, I've always said that angel investing is not a philanthropic activity, but I'm going to stop saying that. Because I think, it act, I think there is a play for philanthropists that um, if they're investing in startups, they are contributing directly to the, to the lifeblood of the community. And I'm actually going to stop saying it's not a philanthropic effort. And so if you know people who might be interested in, in that sort of thing, that there, there would be a benefit. And if you can just channel people towards us, you know, there would be some help. And if we do some, I would like to do some education across the community and perhaps there's some partnership that we could do that we could do there it's 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 kind of new thinking for for us in terms of um, uh, growing the overall base it's, an, it's a new thought pattern for us but I think there's there's some opportunities for partnering there with uh, with the uh, growth of uh, crowdfunding does your angel investment um, um, uh, community do you couple it with uh, crowded uh, crowd in, um, funding or no? So that's yes. the biggest buzz right now in the angel community. We're all trying to figure that out. Um, sometimes it works beautifully together. Sometimes it's um, actually a disincentive to investors. So, uh, and there's um, some of the SEC legislation. We're you know the the uh, SEC uh, regulations around crowdfunding. We're still trying to figure it out and attempt to make it easier for startups to get funding in some ways they've actually made it more difficult um, uh, but so so we're all trying to figure out how that works some of the platforms have made it easier to what we call syndicate deals using the crowdfunding platforms the ones that work with accredited investors and that there's a differentiation between crowdfunding among accredited investors and investors who are not accredited thank you um I, as a outside amateur viewer, have come away with the impression that there are people with money who are very um, a pain to separate themselves from their money, and there are people with money who are more uh, risk-friendly mm -hmm. and more adventurous, and that whenever you find that group of people, you find funding. Mm -hmm. Is that? True, or and how would you characterize the folks in Phila in around Philadelphia? Right. So that is absolutely true. Uh, there is a very small uh, type of person that I, you know, that we were targeting specifically people with that risk profile, um, and generally the only people with that kind of they, they are a rare breed. The only kind of people with that risk profile are people who have been entrepreneurs themselves, um, who have been through. Uh, I mean. Entrepreneurs, by definition, have a higher risk tolerance than most people, although they'll say not really because they're investing in themselves and they trust themselves and their gut. But, um, but so that's a very specific type of risk profile. What I think we need to do is change the equation and to help, uh, and that's why, I'm, that's why I'm thinking about, you know, working with people who do have money but don't have that same risk profile to help them understand um, that there's different ways of looking at angel investing because you're absolutely right and in Philadelphia um, the the balance of uh, risk averse and uh, risk friendly it, 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 the risk friendly is too small I, I believe and so we need to figure out how to change that equation successes and exits change that equation tremendously and spin-offs from corporations and um, People have actually lived through exits. That changes the equation. So, so I think it's critical to change that balance. And and I think you're accurate that the balance is not where we'd like it to be right now. One of the ways our our city is looking at changing that equation is actually through the global economy, by um, creating mechanisms where overseas investors who are very risk friendly. Mm -hmm and adventurous can deposit their money with our city for uh, funding uh, startups and uh, innovation and whatnot in our city. Um, what's your reaction to that idea? So one of the things I think that most angel invest or investors in general will tell you is that when it comes to uh, 
public funding, it, it, to funds um, that are being run by a city or any type of um, uh, governmental, governmental entity, organization, yes. thank you, it's got to have a professional manager. So for example, with the group that Luke was talking about, the fact that first round is running it, yes. we're comfortable with it. If it didn't have someone like first round running it, it would not be well received. I agree with you, and, and I think that if that moves forward, you will find that a group of people such as yourself will be running and managing that fund. Okay. Um, and before I give it to Councilwoman Kenyo Sanchez, I did have one thought that I might have lost for a second, so let me try to think real quick if I could get it back. Um, well, perhaps not. I'll mm -hmm. just hand it off to uh, Councilman. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I think these public discussions are so important, and I'm, and I'm glad that you, you said this a, a few times, and I want to make sure that we capture it, um, is how do we ce celebrate the successes and educate folks to this. You know, you're talking to me about the, this angel funding, and I'm thinking, here we are, um, corporate headquarters of IBC with, you know, billion dollar endowment that they have to invest the universities who have this endowment and how do we, how do we as a government um, incentivize their willingness to take some of those funds that they're investing any, anywhere? Because you're talking about shifting behavior for mm -hmm. risk um, takers versus the other ones. But it is a philanthropic um, situation. And so how do we get them? And the, I, I don't need your answer now, but I think one of the challenges for us is sort of like, how do we get a U pen with billions of dollars to say this is an important investment and we want our endowment to invest in this because it is part of the work that we're doing there. And I don't know how we phrase that and frame it, but I think there's some opportunities there, particularly in Philadelphia, that has a lot of these institutions with billions of dollars. I just think this is something they would want to do. It's for their students, it's for bringing in students, it's kind of like this, the trickle. Right. And they're all talking about it. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a big discussion at the, because I've had the discussions with the universities in particular and some of the, some of the corporations. Um, and actually what they want to do is they want to fund their own startups, which is fine, because then we get those brilliant students from the universities to stay here. So. I know one of the discussions we've been having is around this pilot uh, situation with a lot of the universities and the hospital and how they mm -hmm. contribute in lieu of taxes. And I just think this is one of those areas where we might be able to find some, some common ground with them around where we'd like to see them put some of the, this investment. The other thing is for us as in the public sector is, you know, how do you guys frame an, an investment portfolio for our pension funds? We also invest in pension funds. And one of the things that always concerns me about um, the pension fund is many a times we don't know where our money is going. And the fact is that as, as the fiduciary responsible folks for that, we need to be more deliberate. And this just appears to be one of those activities that we would want to say, hey, we want to invest again mm -hmm. um, without taking us out of too, of too much into the risk factor that we would want to do that. I, again, I don't know how that gets framed, but it's a discussion with our pension fund folks. Um, I've watched uh, very creatively the building trade industry here in the city um, use its, its power and its pension investments to be able to ensure certain development. And I just think we as public sector should be as deliberate, and I don't know how we get there. I mean, you, part of the responsibility is you guys got to challenge us to, and show us how that works. So you've all given me a lot of homework. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'll ask the clerk to call the next witness. Chris Sierra, Arc Web. Would you please state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Thank you. My name is Chris Sierra. I'm the CTO, founder of ArcWeb Software Company in Old City, or the uh, the new newly 
uh, named Nerd Street Corridor. I'm 35 years old. I've been an engineer most of my career. Uh, I've started two Philadelphia businesses here in software technology. I'm from this area. I grew up here. I went to Upper Darby High School. I grew up in Drexel Hill for most of my childhood. So I'm lifelong Philadelphian, uh, at least in spirit. I've been, I first moved here about 18 years ago, and I've, I've mostly been here ever since. I got my bachelor's and my master's at Drexel, so I, I went to college here. Uh, after my graduation, I saw you know, a pretty steep cliff of a lot of my friends leaving the region, which um, you know, people call it the brain drain, and, it, and it's a commonly discussed phenomenon here. Although I think the recent US Census data shows that the sector of age, the age, the age bracket that I'm in is actually one of the growing sectors, and basically uh, many of the students that are going to school here are now choosing to live here. And I think particularly in the technology community, that is largely a function of the university communities and the technology community becoming more integrated. So I am recently bought a home here, uh, recently married. Um, so I'm, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, consider myself uh, lucky, you know, living the dream and uh, you know, a privileged individual in a lot of ways. So uh, I know Council, you, you deal with sort of all walks of life and uh, you know, have to take into consideration a lot of people's opinions. So um, I'm, I guess, more on the fortunate side. Um, so so uh, I'm the owner of my company. Uh, we've grown a lot in the past 18 months. Uh, we've hired about 10 employees uh, that are working in Old City uh, in the last year. Uh, we have about 10 or so other contractors that we work with, so uh, in a lot of ways the workforce is, is closer to, to 20 people. Uh, we're, we've been on a pretty significant growth tear, so we, we continue to, uh, to scale our business, and I, and I think we're going we're gonna to grow significantly and add a lot more Philadelphia jobs this year as well. We build enterprise software that serves mostly financial systems, so uh, we work with banks and uh, financial advisory companies, insurance companies, uh, to build software solutions that run their businesses, make their businesses better. We're currently a bootstrapped company, so we have not had any outside capital. Um, I started the company essentially with a credit card uh, that I personally guaranteed, and uh, you know, use that as a, as a way of helping with cash flow to, to get started. Uh, I did. This is my second company, and Ellen's group, who spoke earlier, actually was one of the investors in, uh, in my last company. So I have done the more venture-focused route of funding a company, and for the time being, I've chose to keep my company bootstrapped. Uh, our company won uh, top 20, Philadelphia, hottest startup from Philadelphia Magazine recently, um, or one of top 20, excuse me. Um, I'm also a Philly Startup Leaders co-founder, uh, which the mission of PSL is to provide support resources and inspiration to technology-focused startup entrepreneurs. So I've been spent hundreds of hours over the last several years uh, trying to make uh, the technology community here a better place for, for people, and particularly people with my focus where I was an engineer and trying to become a business person for the first time, which is, which is a big transition. Uh, just, you know, if you have someone that makes the best pizza in the world, doesn't mean they can run a pizza shop. So same thing in, in engineering and technology. So uh, my, my perspective, I've only been paying attention about seven years as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, and my, my outlook for Philadelphia is incredibly positive. Um, I've seen such amazing growth in the technology community, and I, I, don't, I don't believe it's going to stop. And I just want to name a few uh, organizations that didn't exist seven years ago, and I, I can't, I don't even really remember what it was like uh, before that. So, Philly Startup Leaders, Indy Hall, Benjamin's Desk, Venture Forth, Seed Philly, Dream Adventures, Open Angel Forum, Philly Tech Meetup, Bar Camp, Startup Weekend, Flying Kite Media, Technically Philly. Um, this has all happened in, in that period of time, and uh, that largely defines everything that's going on right now in the technology community. And I don't know exactly what, how that happened or why. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, I can speculate on some things, but uh, it's real and, and it's happening. Um, so I, I am, Bob Mal from Artisan Mobile and Alex Hellman from Indy Hall uh, sort of collectively wrote a post a long time ago that talked about how Philadelphia has an excellent quality, ratio of quality of life to business opportunity. 
and uh, and I and I largely completely agree with uh, with that statement. Uh, I do think that the business opportunity here and the fact that we're so close to so many Fortune 1000 companies within driving distance, and then we have a, a livable city um, that's a major metro area is is a huge huge thing. Um, so it's it's great to to be here to run a business here, and um, I don't I don't see that changing. So. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm seeing now, you know, sort of the first cliff for my peers leaving the city was uh, in college, and I think that problem is, you know, a separate problem and, and getting better. Uh, the next cliff that I'm seeing now, I'm 35 years old, uh, and a lot of my friends are leaving Philadelphia or peers uh, because they're, they or their family or someone is concerned or scared of the public school system here. And so I believe that the public school system is going to become part of the technology community dialogue um, in, in the coming years, and, and it already is uh, in, in a lot of ways. And um, I, I personally, you know, when we moved and chose our neighborhood, we, we chose the Meredith district, so we would be in, in that school district, which we were advised by many friends as being, as being a, a, a great school in the city. Um, a lot of people don't, don't have that uh, opportunity or, or they don't know about it. Um, so I think the school system, and, and it's, been a, it's been a large driver of companies just being in the suburbs uh, in general. And I was one of the people that worked, you know, in King of Prussia or Conshohocken, taking 76, doing the reverse commute for a number of years uh, prior to, to starting a company here. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talent in, in the region. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say the main reason why many of them do not do not choose to live here is because they're they're concerned of the school system. So, just um, I think that's that's going to become an important thing moving forward for for the tech community uh, and and more of an active discussion. So to talk, also wanted to say a few things about about taxes and I think. I don't think taxes in Philadelphia necessarily prevent anyone from starting a company here, at least a, sort of your typical entrepreneur type. I think people that are really financially sophisticated and, and you know, are mapping where, where exactly they're going to locate their business to maximize you know, the, the net income or the return for all their shareholders are a different breed of, of people. I think most startup entrepreneurs, the taxes aren't, I don't think, necessarily a, a huge uh, reason that someone will leave the city. Um, there are things that I would say are, are you know, I, lit I literally, I, was, I should have taken a picture of it. I have a stack of mail on my desk from state, federal, and local governments that I just, I haven't literally gotten through. Um, you know, when running a business, I'm much more focused on our customers and everything else, and I don't have the, the person that opens the mail. So the, the government stuff is usually last. I know I'm paying my taxes and, and everything's good, but um, that's, um, I, don't, I just want to make the point because I think a lot of people have, have said that the taxes are reasons why, why people don't uh, start companies here, and at least in, in the technology community, I don't think that's why people don't start companies here. Um, I do think that you know, there's, there's things that the city can do that would be a lot better. And um, one of them, so in April, you know, in two weeks basically, I'm going to have to pay our, the Philadelphia taxes, BIRT, um, and whatnot for the entire year of 2014. So I literally have to pay nine, eight months in advance my taxes for the whole year, which I haven't, which are based on revenue that I haven't even earned yet. Um, so you know, the city essentially is using the businesses essentially as, a, as, as free credit, ultimately. Um, and I'm sure there might be reasons that that actually reduces the tax burden because there's less overhead of processing, but I, I do think that that's something that should be looked at, and, and I'd love to see some leadership on that getting addressed, because federal and state taxes I pay quarterly. Um, the, other, the other thing, which is you know, more of a personal story, but my last, my last company um, for many years was not profitable. And, um, and to a point where we raised venture money from angel investors. Uh, so we, our expense line was pretty big and our revenue line wasn't. So if you look at my adjusted gross income, multiple years is negative. Uh, so I actually lost money um, from, a, from a tax perspective. Um, but you know, I'm still paying you know, revenue taxes ultimately uh, on, 
on that. So it's, it's, it's almost feels like a slap in the face, especially if you're trying to start a business that's going to employ people and ultimately be successful at sort of that early stage. I, I just think that that's, that's something that should also be looked at. Um, tax credits are interesting. I personally, and this is personally, I haven't spent a ton of time, you know, trying to figure out what tax credits will be ideal for us. I know that there's an employment one, with, which I literally missed. So I, I technically would have had a huge benefit to me 10, 10 employees later um, had I known about it, but I just didn't. It wasn't something that was on my radar screen, uh, and I think we're trying to do it this year. But um, the, uh, there's a Keystone Innovation Zone, which is a Pennsylvania credit, I believe, which is I'm definitely seeing companies move into that zone um, as a result of you know, potentially getting tens of thousands of dollars a year in tax credits for state of PA. So that's definitely you know, causing movement, at least among my peers that I'm seeing. Um, I have a personal gripe that I feel like those KIZ zones are drawn completely arbitrarily around universities and hospitals and not necessarily to um, the areas that I would think would be worthwhile or should also be listed, but I don't think that's something um, necessarily can be handled here. Um, on the capital side, like, like Ellen mentioned, the angel community is small. Um, I'm not, there's a lot of people that, that scream that we need more capital, we need more capital here. Um, I'm, I'm not really one of them. Um, I think capital definitely finds the good businesses. Um, some of the ones that were mentioned earlier, um, RJ Metrics, Artisan Mobile, you know, they're raising money from, from other regions. Um, and, you know, the money finds the good businesses, ultimately. Um, I do think having more here would be, would be great, but that also means that the businesses that come out of Philadelphia are, are just built differently. They're not venture-fueled. So I don't think we're going to see a big Facebook or Twitter or any large consumer internet company come out of here because the, the capital infrastructure just almost largely doesn't exist for consumer-based businesses like that. Um, but, you know, this is a this is a business-to-business -business town, I would say. You know, there's, there's plenty of large companies that are buying technology solutions from smaller companies like my own. And so I think the businesses that get built here are often more of the B2B type flavor of businesses as opposed to consumer-oriented ones. And it also forces a discipline where you're learning how to raise capital essentially with revenues as opposed to uh, with investor money, which is you know, the whole bootstrapping notion that people have mentioned earlier. There's definitely a big bootstrapping sentiment here. There's an annual, well, now it's going to be an annual uh, conference here that's held specifically for bootstrapping businesses called the Bacon Biz Conference uh, that I attended last year and, and was great. Um, so I think the companies get built differently, and that's okay. I feel like that should be embraced. I think there's a lot of uh, folks that are really upset that we don't have the money that New York has or the money that San Francisco has or whatever. And uh, I just think that's what makes us different, that's what makes us unique, and that's what makes us Philadelphia. Um, one, or one other point uh, I would make is uh, I, I definitely feel like they're, the message of how of the business economy, the business climate here, I don't feel like has really gotten out beyond our own little echo chamber of, of Philadelphia. Um, I do think, you know, like I said, with the, the ratio of quality of life with business opportunity here, that should be something that's largely promoted, and I just don't feel like that's really resonating, at least nationally, um, and I think that that would have, have some benefit. My, my, last, uh, my last comment is uh, when, uh, when Philly Startup Leaders was first starting out many years ago, uh, we, we had broken into individual groups um, in, in sort of a workshop format. One was focused on funding, one was focused on technical talent, another one was focused on government, and I, and I recall the government group actually not getting so much traction with the city government and whatnot, um, and, and ultimately more or less disbanding, and then, and then more of the focus being on the other groups. But, um, you know, I think the city's done a, a pretty, pretty ex it has done an excellent job of staying involved, and so, you know, my, my advice is to please continue that, stay involved, and, and work with the tech community to grow it and make it all it can be. All right, well, thank you very much. Let me ask Councilman Tasco. no questions? Okay. I will not have questions because I know we're tight on time. I am letting people testify because we are recording this and I do think it is helpful for some of the um, initiatives that we are currently pursuing. So thank you very much. I'll ask the thank clerk you. to call the next witness. Bridget Daniel, Ed IQ and Wilco Systems.
you please state your name and provide us with your testimony? Thank you. Yes, my name is Bridget Daniel, and I'm Executive Vice President of Wilco Electronic Systems, as well as the CEO of EdIQ Learning. Um, as always, it's an honor and privilege to address this council, Councilman O, Councilwoman Tasco. Always a pleasure. My father sends his regards. Thank um, you. Just so that I can give a little bit of background about what Wilco is and why we're here and what we do. So Wilco is a minority and family-owned private cable operation. We're located in Philadelphia, and it was started by my father, Will Daniel, over 37 years ago. It's one of the last remaining African-American-owned cable systems in the eastern region of the nation, and we've been pri providing services to the greater Philadelphia community since 1977. Uh, we started specializing in providing cable and technology services to low-income residential communities and also MDUs, which are multiple dwelling units. It was Wilco who first began cultivating this niche market for serving pre predominantly minority and low-income communities. And in 2001, we received exclusive contract to be the provider for Philadelphia Housing Authority communities. So we've been able to be here, still be alive, and still maintain our competitive advantage because of a customized and very community-focused approach and social mission. We have price flexibility of our service offerings, and we also have exclusive service agreements with our property owners. Within the last year, however, we've actually now continuing this long legacy of providing low-cost technology to underserved communities through the creation of our new startup company called EdIQ Learning. And EdIQ provides a unique synthesis of affordable ready-to-use technology, specifically source educational content, and offers these services within affordable bundle, bundle packages via monthly subscriptions to an otherwise engaged but very overlooked and underserved marketplace of the ed tech marketplace specifically. So due to our company's longstanding history, unique perspective of being this type of provider for over three decades, which is you know, in itself very admirable, we applaud the intent of this committee and we really urge the committee to focus on creating additional opportunities initiatives that address untapped and underserved workforce development opportunities so that everyone can participate in this new global economy. Specifically, we're asking the committee just to evaluate a couple policies, namely four. One, that there is support and creation of IT job and opportunity program, training programs for low-income communities, low-income population groups specifically, that's one. Two, support and increase enforcement of opportunities for technology-focused MBEs, MBEs are minority business enterprises, that hire and serve low-income populations. Three, continued support and increase opportunities for access to affordable internet. We've done very well as that as a city, but we need that continued support. And four, support of tech businesses with a focus on STEM education and or the creation of programs that promote STEM as an economy builder. So I know that there are, we're short on time. I'm just going to talk about each one of them very briefly. So one, supporting creation of IT job opportunity and training programs for low-income populations. So we know that technology is one of the crucial ways of sustained growth and um, sustainability of economics in Philadelphia, but just all across the country in general. And it's been stated time and time again that this new global economy, the driving forces of our cities and our nation, is comprised of the training of a robust IT workforce, the education of students, and the production of products that are all geared to the increase and development of science, technology, engineering, and math, focuses, abilities, and consumption. However, within Philadelphia, those who primarily live in low-income communities, neighborhoods, or housing, really reap the benefits of participation within this new global economy. But ironically, Many of those technology developments, all these things that are being produced, all these innovations, are being consumed mostly and utilized mostly by the same low-income populations that aren't participating. So given this reality, the city of Philadelphia needs to be a little bit more in tune to face the fact that our city is increasingly changing to a minority, I'm sorry, majority minority population, and consequently, that recent shift in technology consumption and mobile broadband use by people of color should then not be alarming. So just a couple few statistics. According to Pew, more people of color rely more heavily on their cell phones for internet access. 
Among some mostly internet users, 43% are black and non-Latino, 60% are Latino, and while overall 34% of all users are cell mostly internet users. Other demographic characteristics are include that all people in this group tend to mostly be uh, young, 18 to 29. They're less educated, meaning that 40% of 45% of cell internet users have a high school diploma or less, and they're also less affluent. Reports on mobile broadband use also show that more people of color use their cell phones and their smartphones for broadband-enabled activities like application downloading. So what did all these statistics mean? Why am I rattling them off? Why do I think it's relevant? I think it's very relevant because while the growth of mobile use among people of color, particularly low-income people, is beginning to narrow that disparity with access, the challenge is that as a city, we're not reaping the benefit of the opportunities that we can by cultivating those consumers and making them producers and transitioning those minority population groups into actually producing some of these technology developments that they're actually consuming and buying. So we abide by these statistics. Logic would say that the city created opportunities to turn these consumers into producers then the economy would dramatically grow leaps and bounds, particularly within those targeted areas that we're trying to spur economic, particularly economic growth. Uh, so there are actually two programs that I just want to bring up for the community that are working right now that I think are, are good ones to model from. One is called the Step It Up America campaign, just recently launched, actually launched by Technically Philly about maybe two weeks ago. And it's a 12-week training program designed to teach urban women of color the skills needed to succeed in IT-related jobs. It's organized by UST Global, a Southern California-based IT consulting firm with offices around the world. And this effort has finally come to Philadelphia. It's going to start this month. They're still patching a lot of that together, but I think it's a great program that's targeting training low-income, particularly women who are underrepresented in STEM fields, about how to actually participate as innovators and not just consumers. And I think lastly, uh, there's another program that I'm sure you all are very well aware of, the Mayor's Commission on Literacy, um, which is a program that has launched free online courses for low, low, um, excuse me, low literate adults. It was a, a launch last month. And that can also serve as a model to build off of and incorporate technical training as well as digital literacy. Uh, so I think that these are very important because we need to bridge that gap of the workforce it's great that we have all these startups and great that we have all these young innovators and you know, Philadelphia is creating this new tech personality for ourselves. But if we're not all able to participate in that global economy, and if we're not all able to be, able to be hired, if we're not all looking at the people that truly make up the majority of this population group, the majority of the workforce, and they're not able to participate, then we're really missing out on what this is all about um, and really at least missing out on what we can grow as a city. So number two, the support and increase in enforcement of opportunities for technology-focused MBEs that hire and serve low-income populations. So the U.S. Department of Commerce, MDA, has illustrated the value that MBEs generally add to the U.S. economic output. In 2012, the MDA found that a result of rapidly growing minority population, MBEs annually contribute about $1 trillion to U.S. aggregate ag economic output. Um, what they've also found that MBEs are more than likely to own non I'm sorry, are more likely than non-minority-owned businesses to export and conduct business in other languages other than English. They also regularly invest in communities that other companies overlook or underserve. There's this one quote, I wasn't going to read it, but I think this is very important. The barriers to entry and expansion faced by MBEs are, are very costly to the United States productivity, especially as minorities represent an increasing share of the total population. So when we limit their business success to only a few groups and not the broad range of all diverse groups that comprise the United States, we're constraining innovative ideas for new products and services and access to global markets where many minority entrepreneurs have a competitive advantage based on cultural knowledge, family and social ties, and language capabilities. So I just mentioned that because a more robust array of technology-focused MBEs, or at least policies that support them and that are supported by the city, supported by this committee, could deliver a range of new opportunities for the underemployed and the unemployed who live in low-income communities. And in the broadband era, much emphasis has been placed on the importance of entrepreneurship and global competitiveness. 
However, the specific presence of MBEs, we could boost, boost competition and would benefit consumers, particularly those who are in traditionally underserved communities. Uh, third, there's a continued support and increased opportunities for access to affordable internet. I think we all know that broadband is an important engine of job creation, facilitator of education, health care, means of ensuring that all Americans have access to the benefits of the internet. And I think that's no more important than in Philadelphia. As a city, we've done very well in the last couple years in, in really bringing and creating successful partnerships around broadband access. I think everyone in this room is pretty much really aware of Philadelphia Freedom Rings and the Key Spot program, the Digital on Ramps program. These initiatives alone have allowed more than 300,000 people to gain access to digital literacy skills along with the offering of affordable 1495 services and uh, robust internet services of wireless components. And that's also through a partnership that my company has with the Urban Affairs Coalition and Clear Mobile. So we just want to say that we think that this is important to sustain and to continue. Um, broadband is the equalizer. It's the enabler for everyone. Um, and it's also the platform that will help many of these companies, many people, uh, gain those global opportunities by having access to internet. Lastly, support of tech businesses with a focus on STEM education and or the creation of programs that promote STEM as an economy builder. So there's no doubt that to advance our economy and our society, we need to create the next great technology innovations, not just consume them. That's why there's such urgency for not only Philadelphia, but the US to develop a stronger workforce of experts in science, technology, engineering, and math. We know the statistics according to the US Department of Labor, only 5% of US workers are employed in those fields. However, they're responsible for more than 50% of sustained economic expansion. That's a very interesting stat right there. So since STEM-related disciplines are responsible for many of these societal innovations that make our world better, it's clear that to benefit our society, our city, we have to encourage more students to study STEM. Unfortunately, we as a city and as a nation are trending in the opposite direction. We know the challenges of public school, education, et cetera. But to turn this trend around, we need to improve both the size and the composition of the pipeline. So just three ideas. One, we need to increase the size of the STEM education pipeline by maintaining an enthusiasm for science, technology, engineering, and math throughout high school and college. Purpose of Wilco even starting at IQ was for this reason. It gives parents and students an opportunity to engage in the quote unquote cool and innovative digital education resources in the home. It provides it through a monthly mobile and affordable monthly subscription. And then it also gives the, the content makers, the people that make these innovations, the opportunity to tap into those markets that they don't usually tap into or are overlooked by the larger companies. So this is just one example of a local company trying to address this STEM uh, disparity. Second, we need to improve the composition of STEM education pipelines to include more women and underrepresented minorities. Although women fill close to half of all the jobs in the US, they hold less than 25% of STEM-related jobs. At the same time, 43% of school-aged children today are of Afro-American, Latino, and Native American descent. Yet all the in engineering bachelor's degrees in the US are less than 15% are awarded to underrepresented minorities. So it'd be great to start to reconcile those trends, specifically in our city. And finally, let's not overlook all the contributions from just local personal efforts. Sometimes it's just great to have a role model that you see, that kids can see is in STEM, involved in STEM, is using STEM, um, produces STEM products. Uh, for me, that was my father, my family. <clears throat> but it doesn't take a lot for us to personally get involved and show that it can be possible. So to conclude, as we look to the future, improving and properly cultivating a diverse workforce, um, through the support of MBEs or the integration of overlooked populations to create a great workforce, a diverse workforce, access to affordable technology and broadband, and the broadening of the size and competition of STEM education pipelines will strengthen our city's global competitiveness and unleash new innovations that will propel Philadelphia forward. I know it's not easy, it can be very challenging, but I urge this committee to stay encouraged to do the research, to do the work, um, and if you do this, the investment will definitely pay off. We have seen it, we are part of it, and we believe it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that Councilman Tasco has a question. Yes. Well, I don't have a question. I have a comment. Yes. It's like deja vu. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we were here about 
20 years ago. Uh -oh. so we, <laughs> All right. The whole issue of the telecommunication yeah. highway and would we be ready and what we were going to do with the schools to prepare yeah. them. And uh, at least um, uh, Ed Rendell, Mayor Ed Rendell was very, um, had foresight to establish the Mayor's Commission on Technology mm -hmm. to address some of the issues that we're raising here today. Um, but the unfortunate thing about the way we operate in Philadelphia, it becomes that mayor's commission. Right. And so the incoming mayors may not, not that they don't see the mm -hmm. value of the program, but have the other agendas. That, mm -hmm. So I'm going to work with my colleague where we can come up with a way to institutionalize hmm. any effort by the city to address the issues of um, a current technology in the future, the growth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of uh, companies in the city and also mm -hmm. reaching out to uh, new innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's what we need to do because Carol Smith, you remember mm -hmm. Carol Smith I do. headed mm -hmm. up that commission mm -hmm. and uh, certainly had a, no, I see someone in the back shaking his head, mm -hmm. uh, had uh, some prominent business people, a part of that commission who were very interested in working to um, um, to address the whole issue of new of technology. We've mm -hmm. come a long way since then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it moves very quickly, so you have to really stay yes. on it. So I just wanted to say that, and sitting mm -hmm. here listening, we've had these hearings before, but mm -hmm. they were long before. You became a young lady, young lady. Right. I knew you when you right. were a little girl. Yeah. And I'm real proud of you, where you, you come, your father, mm -hmm. and what you're doing. And I appreciate all the folks who've testified today, and certainly appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask the clerk to call up the next two witnesses together. There's two microphones there. And let me uh, recognize that uh, Councilman uh, Dennis O'Brien, former Speaker of the Pennsylvania House, has joined us. Thank you very much. Uh, clerk, would you call up the next two witnesses? These are our final witnesses, and then I will certainly have uh, an opportunity for Councilman O'Brien to make a statement. Will Reynolds, Sear Interactive, David Adidan, trellist. C Councilman O'Brien is not going to make a statement right now, so we'll begin with your testimony. Why don't we start from uh, your left, my right, and uh, please introduce yourself and provide us with your statement. Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Reynolds. I'm the founder of Sear Interactive, a business located in Northern Liberties. So um, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about the story of Sear, um, and I think the saddest part is we haven't met before, right? And we're one of the companies um, that's uh, lauded with accolades across the globe, and we haven't met, so I'm really glad that we're getting a chance to meet. Um, in 2010, Sear was a $2.1 million company. Here we are sitting in 2014. We fully expect to be well into the, the low teens this year, so we're growing like crazy. Um, I get to see a lot of cities, and I get to see a lot of cities with startup communities. Um, I speak globally. Uh, last year uh, I spoke on search marketing, which is what we do, understanding Google. Um, I, I brought those topics in our belief system to places like Brazil, Turkey, Munich, London, Israel, Paris, where I have spoke to a bunch of companies that are in the technology space, and I get to see their cities, and I get to experience their startup communities. We are currently 80 employees at Sear. Uh, three years ago, we were 15. So we're rocking and rolling. Um, due to our inability to find amazing talent um, that was all willing to relocate to Philadelphia, we've had to open a second office in San Diego where everyone wants to relocate. 40% um, of our hires are not from Philadelphia. We relocate 40% of our hires. We have hired people from Silicon Valley. We have hired people as far away as Orlando, Chicago, Minneapolis, Boston, Atlanta, and it goes on and on and on. Our appetite for amazing people is insatiable, and we just have to go get them. One of the things you guys have done that I've been really glad to see is when I call someone up who lives in Minneapolis or lives in Silicon Valley, and I talk about what we can do together here in Philly, they actually are willing to relocate themselves and their families to come after they do research on Philly. That's very, very important. Um, everything from what we're doing with, uh, you know, all the different organizations in the city to make it something that, that is marketed well, that has an impact when I call somebody up and say, hey, are you willing to relocate from Portland, Oregon to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? So thank you for that. Um, we just won Best Places to Work. We were in the Philly 100 um, five years in a row, which makes us a Hall of Fame, uh, Philly 100 company. Uh, we are uh, three years in a row. We've uh, been one of the winners in the inner city 
um, there's an inner city competition of com companies located within inner cities all over the country. We've been in that three years running. We'll probably be in again this year as one of the fastest growing companies that has dedicated itself to staying in the city because we believe in cities. Um, the president, William Clinton, has actually awarded us an award uh, that we won a few years back that connected us with some very interesting people locally who have also helped to advise us and help us to grow. Our clients are huge. Um, we work with two of the top 10 largest banks in the world. Um, we have a client that sells makeup in Brazil, a travel company in Nigeria. One of our clients is LinkedIn, something we probably all use. Um, our clients are also some of the best performing IPO, uh, tech IPOs. Last year, uh, ServiceNow and LinkedIn were considered two of the most prominent tech IPOs in terms of their performance, and both of them were clients of SEER. So our ability to attract amazing clients uh, has is, is, is been really, really awesome. Uh, something that's really interesting, we're talking today, and I will have to leave in a bit, is the director of marketing of a company that just went IPO to the tune of $100 million two weeks ago is here in Philadelphia right now visiting SEER because we're getting ready to start off a campaign, and she's the director of marketing at coupons.com. So they are a Silicon Valley-based company, but they've come all the way across the country to find a technology company that does something with Google that they can't find in the city where Google shares their streets. Um, we also, uh, one of our clients is Alibaba, the largest Chinese uh, e-commerce company. They might be overtaking Amazon soon. So all of these companies are choosing to work with Sear, and the beauty is they get here, they come here, and they visit. So in terms of our relationship with the city, um, people no longer think that I'm crazy for locating my, my company in the city. Thank you for that. Um, it's great to see the momentum around other companies that are choosing to locate in the city. Um, we've been recruited by other cities. We've been recruited by both Boston and Baltimore. It's interesting. We haven't met, but yet Boston and Baltimore knew who we were and wanted to see if we wanted to go to open our next office in their cities. We should have met before today. Um, I want another Comcast here. And I'll tell you why. Not because Comcast isn't a client of ours. I don't need them to grow my business. When you talk about the, uh, the venture community, I swapped CEO roles with a friend of mine who runs a company in Seattle. And when I met with his board of venture capitalists, they put $25 million into his company. You know what they were? They were former executives at places like Boeing, Microsoft, Amazon. And those people that made so much money want to be philanthropists and help their startup communities. So I don't have the money right now to put $25 million into another company, right? But the people at those big companies, sometimes they do. And if we can attract more of those companies here, then a lot of those people are going to want to invest in this community. So it's really important for us to get another company of that heft, I hope. And hopefully you guys can help be a part of that. Um, I want us to market against the tax situation. You know, we kind of, I feel like we hide against it and we kind of look at it as this thing that businesses hate, and we do. But we don't market against it. You buy a home in Philly and have to pay property tax, I'll pay the wage tax all day long, right? Relative to what my property taxes would cost if I lived in a lot of other places. Let's get smart about marketing against it and say, yes, it's here, and yes, we're working against it, but if you actually look at the bigger picture, let's not make that your excuse for not being in Philadelphia. Um, if you want to attract innovative companies, you guys are going to have to be innovative as much as you can because we run fast. I don't understand your world, and you guys probably don't completely understand mine, but what I know is that we need each other in order to both make this city successful. Um, I don't get policy. I get getting things done. I get things done. That's how our company grows. That's how these small technology companies grow to $19 million companies sometimes, or billion dollar companies, in two and three years. And how can our city government help us to get things done versus talking about getting things done? So the more that we can do things and the less we can talk about them, I think the more we're going to attract startup companies because that's how we all operate. We wake up, we have an idea, we start working on it. If the government gets in the way of that, then we have to go somewhere else that will support it, like Nevada, prime example. Um, so Nerd Street is the last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about. Setting aside Nerd Street, you guys don't understand entirely the power of setting this aside, so I wanted to make sure you get it. Every time I'm running down the Embarcadero in San Francisco, where I am consistently at because I have so many clients out there, I'm always jealous by the names of the companies I see when I run along the street. Just to see them over and over and over again. When I visited coupons.com, I swung by Google. I saw a self-driving car on my trip when I was out there. Not I stopped at Google, I saw it driving next to us. 
on the five, I believe, or the 101. This is amazing. And when you see those things, you kind of feel like, man, there's something happening here. There's something happening here when I go for a run and I, I see Google and then I see Intuit and then I see Norton Antivirus. And as I'm just running along the street, seeing those companies over and over again, it kind of feels like there's something happening here. That's what I think Nerd Street can do for Philadelphia. Because when somebody comes down Third Street, think about when we take um, students to come visit our, our technology companies. We can just walk them all down. We don't have to bust them from place to place to place. They're going to say, this is a street where something is happening. And I love the fact that you guys have gotten behind that and supported that. Um, so I don't have to be jealous about San Francisco anymore. So the last thing I'll say um, is it's my job to create a culture that attracts people from all over the country. And I think I've done a decent job of creating that innovative culture. And I want to work on innovative issues that are going to attract people, like I said, to my company. And as you guys talk about Philly getting better and can help be a part of that, and the, the ability for there to be better people here, I need talent. That's why I'm in San Diego right now. There are 16 jobs in San Diego right now because I just couldn't get enough people here in Philly to help us grow. Um, and I also don't mind having to, go, having to go out to San Diego in the middle of the winter for a while either. Um, but I just want you to leave you guys with that. Sierra Interactive doesn't have an office in San Diego because we have a lot of West Coast clients. They were fine with us being on the, East, on the, on the EST. We have a West Coast office because we couldn't find enough people to help us grow given our pace of growth. So the tax credits are nice and I'll take them, but as a growing company, I need the talent. And hopefully you guys, from hearing some other testimony today and any questions that you may have later, um, maybe we can work on that together because it's been great to have a chance to finally meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there's many questions, and, but as you said, it's good to meet and we can finish this conversation or continue this conversation. And I very much appreciate your stepping up and, uh, and offering your, um, yourself to be involved in this process. Uh, with that, I'll ask the clerk to uh, call the next witness. David Adadam. Please state your name and provide us your testimony. My name is Dave Adadam. I'm the founder and CEO of Trellis Marketing and Technology. And first, uh, I'd like to thank you on, uh, for having me here. I'm honored to be here today. Hopefully what I can do is give you a perspective on why a Wilmington-based company has started a Philadelphia office. And I think there's some significant things here that I can help shed some light on for you. Um, but first, a little bit about Trellis. We are, Trellis is a marketing and technology professional services firm. We have approximately 125 people located in Wilmington, Delaware, and then outskirts of Wilmington and Philadelphia. And other areas outside of this region as well. We provide marketing, design, and technology services from four practice areas, marketing and branding, IT and application development, education and learning, and business strategy services. So similar to SEER Interactive, I think we have a powerhouse of an organization uh, and uh, we are growing quite rapidly. Our interests right now and where we're going is to build into a thousand person company over the next 10 years as a family of companies with products and services. So I think the opening the Navy Yard is one of the most important things we could do in terms of making that uh, a part of, um, uh, making that a piece of what we need in order to build that reality. So we have had the desire and the ability to move to Philly for quite some time. We've had desire from, we've had employees that are come from Philly for 10 years. They've come back down to Wilmington, riding the train or driving cars down to the Wilmington office. But we hadn't done anything about it until recently. There were four key considerations that have come together in order for us to finally make that call and pull the trigger on it. And I'll tell you about them in a minute. But I think what might be interesting is actually uh, a personal, on a personal note, the profile of somebody like me, an entrepreneur that grew up in Wilmington, I now live in Chadsford, but grew up in Wilmington, and who came to baseball games at the Phillies game at, at that stadium as a kid. And then in my 20s, I was hanging out on South Street some, probably causing no, no good, you know. In the 30s, I was, uh, in my career, I was working in Bala Kenwood and uh, doing business in Philadelphia. 
in the 40s, as I started, as my business had really grown and I had made it, I started to come into all the Philadelphia restaurants. And so now, as I'm 51 years old, I'm ready to open an office here in Philadelphia. That's the beginning of a, of a, new, of a new era for our company. But back to the business points that catalyzed our decision to come to Philadelphia. There were four things that happened. Number one, and to, again, some of this is going to mirror some of what, what, Chris, uh, Chris? Chris, sir? What, what Chris just said. Philly isn't just a big city where you can get some talent. Philly is a great city. We've had employees, as I said, that drive from Philadelphia down. We thought as those single employees would grow a little bit older and get married, they would move to Wilmington. They didn't. We thought as they grew older and they had kids, they would move, to, they would move down to Wilmington. They didn't. The urban revival in Philadelphia as a city is quite attractive for people. And what's happening now is many of my employees that are in the Wilmington area want to move to Philadelphia for, for many reasons. But the idea that Philadelphia is not just a good city where, with a lot of people you can attract talent isn't the only thing. It's a great city where that you, we need to keep this going to be able to attract the right people. The second thing is that the the business, the business location. We're locating in the Navy Yard. The Navy Yard is a great location for us because, sure, there's some incentives with the, the KOZ. They're, that's terrific for us. But the other thing about the Navy Yard is that when we were trying to recruit people from outside the, the city of Philadelphia, one of the things is that many people didn't want to, want to drive into the city. But the Navy Yard is a, is a great location where that you can really attract people to drive down there. They don't get the they don't, we don't have to deal with the hustle and bustle of either coming into the city or with some of the traffic you might find in the Conchie or up on the, on the Blue Route. So the Navy Yard is a great location and has some great incentives. That's a second consideration that came, that came into play for us. The third consideration was that the, the plethora of businesses that are in Philadelphia create uh, a lot of interesting work for our employees. Our charter is three different things to of why are we are in business. We're not in business just to build a company and then to, to sell it. We're in business to do three things. One, to build a work home for our employees. Two, is to have everybody share in the financial success as we now are an employee shared company. It's the equivalent of an employee owned company, 100% employee owned, but what we've done is we've taken it to a new level and we call it employee shared in terms of everything from decisions and. Uh, many things that go beyond what you would find in typical employee ownership. The third reason is to give interesting work to employees. There's a lot of interesting companies in the Philadelphia area, and as a result of that, uh, we, we are doing interesting work for, with our employees. So to give them the interesting work because of Philadelphia is something that's a, that's, that, that we've wanted to do. The fourth reason that, we, that, the fourth reason that Philadelphia became a catalyst, uh, or was the fourth reason that, that catalyze our decision to move to Philadelphia was that there is great ideas and big ideas happening in Philadelphia. Again, from, from Chris here in Sierra Interactive, but Chris Wink in what, te in what he's doing with, with uh, the Philly Tech Week. That was significant. We were introduced to Philly Tech Week last, last year. We participated in it. This year we're participating in it much further. As a result of that, those big ideas, it, made, it, it was the fourth reason for us to open an office in Philadelphia. Chris bringing together the ecosystem and innovation in Philadelphia is something that is, is of interest to us. We want to be around others that are like us. We want to be in others where that you can create innovation because you have multiple companies like us that then are trying to, trying to uh, build and do significant work. What happens is that as you build that and you bring people together, you're going to continue to bring more. The Home Depot across from the Lowe's brings more people to shop regardless of the fact that they're competitors that sit right, want, want right across from each other. That's what needs to happen as well. And that is something that interests us, especially because of that happening at that time. So those are the four key reasons, or four considerations that occurred for us to decide to open this Philadelphia office finally. Now, now many firms in Wilmington and many firms outside of Philadelphia may want to open a Philadelphia office. But I think we're quite, quite ambitious, a lot more ambitious than, uh, than what you would find in just opening a satellite office. We're considering, again, going to 1,000 people in the next 10 years. We won't do it without sacrificing 
We will not do it if we had to sacrifice our quality of our work or, this, or the culture of our company. We won't grow if we would have to sacrifice that. So we're looking for the talent that we need. The talent that we need in Philadelphia, part of it comes from the fact that we have the great schools. It's not just good schools, but it's great schools. With Penn, having people that can be turned out as managing consultants, but also holistic in, their, in the way that they look at life, holistic in the way that they're, 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 uh, they're educated, is something that's important to us, again, as we said, we're mo as we've moved to an employee shared company. So Philly has a lot that's very attractive to us. And so with that, our headquarters is still in Wilmington, Delaware. We still have many employees down there. I know all, uh, all of the, the governor, the, the, our senators, our congressmen all know me by first name. Um, but where could our headquarters be in the future? I'm not sure where that move's going to be. Maybe there'll be more catalysts in the future that'll, that'll help to, uh, to make that decision for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, let me ask my colleagues if they have any comments or questions. Councilwoman Pasco. Yes. Thank you both for your testimony. I'm very excited. Uh, Chris? Will. Will. I thought she said Will. Chris. I thought it was no, Chris. You Chris. told him Chris. Uh, I wrote sorry. down. I was saying. Can we strike Chris from Chris. the record every time I said that? Will. It's OK. Will, um, yes. <laughs> that you're excited about being in Philadelphia. And, um, uh, and to both of you, we have not only Penn, it's not the only school here, we have Temple, we have St. Joe's, we have Villanova, we have Drexel, uh, Rosemont, we have a, we're a, a, a county and city that's surrounded by colleges and universities, and uh, you're going to have to begin to develop relationships with those institutions to see if you can harness some of those students who are uh, coming out of, the, of those institutions to uh, entice them to stay in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if, and if they don't come into the city, and we're really trying to uh, make the city uh, family friendly, um, you know, they can still stay in Rosemont, but they can they commute to Philadelphia. <laughs> but uh, I think we have a lot of uh, 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 venues here, a lot of assets here that are, are great for this uh, this valley and this area, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, you talked about, you didn't know, uh, Willa, what we do. Well, what we do is try to be advocates for uh, individuals like you, and that's why uh, I'm real pleased with my colleague, uh, Councilman O. He has really been uh, a joy to have on this city council, uh, and um, he is has trying to work to um, make Philadelphia more progressive. And uh, so we're willing to help you in any way to navigate the system to make it better for you, your advocates. So, uh, and I think we need to have continued dialogue whether we have it here in a public um, debate or in a small meeting just to say, this is what we need, can you help us get through this, can you help us get through that, that's what we want to do. And I'm sure uh, the chair will make sure that it happens. So feel free to uh, access uh, the entire, every member of this council is interested in what happens in Philadelphia. All of the members want every neighborhood to grow. Some will be amenable um, to what we're doing. We can find spots for different kinds of uh, businesses. So uh, I appreciate your sir coming to uh, the Navy Yard. Uh, we have uh, Philadelphia sort of like, um, uh, they don't really promote themselves. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina, so, <laughs> but I'm a Philadelphian. But I think we're a little shy about being Philadelphians mm -hmm. and not really standing up saying, hey, here we are and this is what we can do. We have a lot of talent here, a lot of smart people a lot of people who care about this city. So I want to say I appreciate your being here. And whatever we can do, we will do it. And I believe the councilman will further this dialogue about um, uh, this whole issue, rather than just having this hearing and not following through. OK? Right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. She's bringing me up. I wouldn't be here but for her support. And she's a mentor to so many. So whenever she gives me those good accolades, you know she's bringing me up. Do we have any other? Uh, yes, uh, Councilman O'Brien. 
I'd, I'd just like to amplify what uh, Councilwoman Tasco was talking about. Uh, we have the finest academic health centers in the world here, and we have 85 institutions of higher learning right in this area. So uh, to uh, amplify what you were talking about, we've, um, over the years, reached out to some of the presidents of those universities, for instance, at, at Chestnut Hill, and we created an adult service model for individuals living with autism that doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. And they brought uh, their educators, their special educators, um, their <coughs> social workers, and, um, and other uh, departments together. And, uh, and we rewrote that curriculum and created new professionals. So I think uh, with Chairman O, uh, it would be advantageous to bring the presidents of those universities together, entertain uh, the types of discussions that uh, you're bringing to us, and help them embrace a new way of educating the kind of talent that you need to grow your industries. I don't think there's any place on the planet that is more fertile for this conversation, as Councilwoman Tasco and O have said, than this region right here. Um, I would like, sorry, if you could amplify what you were talking about, University of Pennsylvania, for my benefit, a holistic education. What did you mean by that? Well, when trying to get my son into, uh, <laughs> into University of Pennsylvania, I learned a lot about it, but we also have some of our employees are, are UPenn grads. Um, they look at the, the person as a whole from their uh, giving, back in, uh, giving back to the community, giving back in life, um, and using their education for uh, powers beyond uh, making money in a career. So as we are an employee shared company, and, and take each person into our company looking for that, that uh, person that would deserve to be an owner in a company um, such as ours. Um, we're looking for people that have that same, uh, that same mantra, the same philosophies. Um, so not just, uh, not just talent, but the right type of character and the right type of uh, conceptual level of thinking beyond uh, the skills and performance that they would bring. Good. I, that's what I thought you meant by that. There are some wonderful curriculums that are being offered by our universities, but they can be enhanced with more specificity uh, with the information that you can provide us. Um, uh, I do believe that there is, um, pathologically optimistic that their generation coming up is going to mu be much more holistic in their viewpoint than perhaps this generation has been. And I can see that uh, with uh, my kids and some of the other individuals and the way they, they approach life. But I do see that energy. When you traverse the various streets of Philadelphia, you see that energy and you see people coming here as you've explained. Uh, this is a great place uh, with a great progressive future. Uh, but uh, again, I don't think there's any place <coughs> on the planet that offers the opportunity, if there is the appropriate dialogue of engagement uh, so that they know what it is. Uh, and they're willing to put the, merge the departments together in unique conversations that have never been done before. So thank you for your information, and I thank Council Minow for his uh, forward-looking program today. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to conclude our, our hearing, particularly thanking um, Philly Tech Week, uh, Chris Wink back there, technically Philly, and, and everyone involved, all our witnesses. Um, my closing note would be this, that uh, we have uh, learned uh, tremendously valuable um, things today from you, um, uh, and uh, certainly we will continue this um, uh, effort to take, you know, the, the expertise and experience in the real world and uh, figure out how we do what we do, policy, regulation, laws, and other things so that you will be able to see the results that you want to see. Um, it is important for us to find a way to engage you and to have you engage your colleagues because you have, uh, um, within your communication lines, people in this city and outside this city who are so very interested in the success and growth uh, and competitiveness of our city. Um, and everything they want it to be, it could be with their input. And without their input, it will be what it's going to be. And it could be so much better. From every issue that was raised, from our public schools, 
technology in all of our communities, opportunities for everyone in and around our city, engagement in the global you know, uh, economy, um, our relationships, our, our, our reputation as a city, uh, what we are uh, uh, as a community envisioning for the future, not just in terms of uh, money that we earn, but also the quality of life and the values that we enjoy together. Um, it will not be, I am sure, what it could be. It's going to be something. And we're the ones who are going to do it because we're the ones that are elected. But if we're not elected by you, if we're not being schooled by you, we will do the best we can without you, and it's not going to be that good. So please, reach out to your communities and have them involved with us. We're going to try to do the best we can to make this a better city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.